Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbare, and welcome back to Weaving Worlds. For today's subject, I'm going to focus on something that can improve both your storytelling and your world building, something that many authors completely fail to pay attention to. Food. When human beings describe something, we tend to focus on our two primary senses, vision and hearing. However, as any good writer's guide will tell you, you can really engage your audience by describing all of the senses, and one efficient way to do that is to describe food. The need to eat and the desire to eat well are two things that every single human has in common, not to mention most other complex animals. However, variations in ingredients, diets, and preparation methods can also give you clues about cultures, social classes, and even geography. As such, by thinking about how the people in your setting eat, and by including a meal in your stories, you can describe the nature of your setting both quickly and naturally. Common Meals A common meal is something that most people eat regularly. It's cheap, it's simple to make, the ingredients are easy to find, and depending on the time period, the ingredients are also locally made and either in season or easy to preserve. Common meals also tend to be nutritious and reasonably tasty, and only in a few isolated areas do people tend to suffer chronic malnutrition. After all, if a land can't sustain a healthy human population, then humans generally don't live there for very long. The nature and variety of ingredients in a common meal can tell you a lot about the culture that eats it. Coastal communities come up with a lot of different ways of eating fish, and communities near forests will know how to cook rabbits, deer, and other game animals. If poor people eat a lot of corn, wheat, or lentils, that's because those crops are cheap and plentiful in that area. If a community has a more modern diet with plenty of variety, out-of-season vegetables, expensive meats, and processed foods, then that means they have a high technology level, at least in terms of agriculture and shipping. It's a common misconception that peasants throughout history were chronically starving and malnourished. Now, it's true enough that when famines and droughts and wars come around, the peasants are the first ones to suffer, but in times of peace and stability, peasants actually ate fairly well by modern standards. And when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Both male and female peasants had labor-intensive jobs to do, and they needed plenty of calories and a balanced diet to do them. Today's issues with malnutrition and obesity are the result of a move away from hard labor jobs and the rise of processed foods that contain more calories and fewer nutrients. Another interesting point is that by and large, it is the common meals of a culture that cross borders and become popular elsewhere. Pizza started out as a southern Italian staple dish. Sandwiches became popular because factory workers needed something fast and portable, and stir-frying didn't become a popular technique until the 19th century, when most Chinese families could finally afford oil in a large wok. Exotic Meals Exotic meals are whatever a culture thinks of as rare, expensive, and prestigious. Nutrition and flavor are secondary concerns at best, and what's most important is that few people get to eat these meals, and as many people as possible know that you're eating them. As such, while common meals can catch on fairly easily in new areas, exotic meals tend to be extremely localized based on how rare a food is in an area. For instance, caviar or fish eggs is a popular delicacy in the United States and Europe because it's hard to collect in large quantities, but the flavor is just fishy and salty. Nutritionally, all it gives you is vitamin B12 and sodium. Shark fin soup is popular in China, but the only thing the fins do is thicken the stock. Edible gold foil has become popular in modern bakeries, but it obviously has no nutritional value and, at least in my opinion, it always looks tacky. Another modern delicacy is lobster, since it has to be boiled pretty much immediately after you kill it. But a couple hundred years ago in Maine, lobsters were so plentiful and easy to catch that they were served in prisons. Something else that can make a meal more exotic is the cooking method. Like I mentioned earlier, stir-frying used to be an exotic technique, back when oil and large pots were more expensive. And while at one point pastries were exclusively made for European aristocrats, today you can buy cookies and muffins at your local grocery store. As such, modern pastry chefs go above and beyond by creating edible sculptures for special occasions and wealthy clients, and they invent new baking techniques that make use of physics and chemistry. 
What we learn from these trends is that exotic meals evolve over time based on which ingredients are rare and expensive, and which techniques demand expensive equipment or more training than what the average home cook can manage. And even though expensive food is rarely more nutritious than common food, people all over the world and in every time period always want to eat what they don't have. Spices Spices are another cultural hallmark. Fragrant herbs, tree bark, roots, and fruit rinds they don't really add much in the way of nutrition, but they can change the smell and the taste of a meal, and change a regular meal into something amazing and unusual. Every culture with access to spices uses them, although how they use them and what flavors they prefer can depend on the time, place, and social class. India is home to a large variety of spices, and so Indian cultures use a variety of spices in most of their dishes. They'll even add spices to their drinks, like chai tea. On the other hand, medieval England had few native spice plants, and so traditional English meals tend to have few spices, and spices from Asia, like nutmeg and pepper, were in that area worth more than their weight in gold. Today, spices are a lot easier to come by. Most of them are easy to preserve, and a little goes a long way, and so you can buy a good spice blend for a few bucks and use it to flavor your meals for the next several months. There are still a few rare spices, however, and as it turns out, you can also modify the taste of spices by changing how you grow them and the kind of soil you use. And even if that's not true, or if most people can't actually tell the difference, you can still get people to spend more money on spices by telling them that it's true. As such, I imagine that exotic spices will once again become popular and expensive if and when space colonization begins. Heat Capsaicin is an interesting chemical. It produces a burning sensation in mammals, including humans, but other animals, like birds, are unaffected. A lot of plants produce capsaicin in their fruits to protect their seeds, which can safely pass through a bird's digestive system, but not a mammal's. However, humans don't just tolerate this heat, we seek it out, although some cultures seek it more than others. Heat tolerance and heat preference can vary a lot between individuals, but then it also depends on things like culture and location. By and large, the cultures that enjoy hot foods the most tend to live in hot environments like southern Italy, Mexico, Louisiana, India, and Thailand. Cultures that tend to avoid heat live in cold climates like England, Norway, and the northern United States. Now these days, cultural exchanges have made hot foods easier to come by even in the north, but even so, this regional preference is still mostly true. Drinks Drinks can be just as regional and idiosyncratic as any meal. Just about every sedentary society in the world developed alcohol. Although it's not clear if it's a requirement to building cities, since alcohol is antibacterial, or if it's just a natural discovery that follows the invention of agriculture. Either way, ancient cultures made alcohol using whatever grains or fruits they had available, and so you had beer in Mesopotamia, grape wine in Greece and Italy, and rice wine in China and Japan. Distilled alcoholic drinks are a relatively recent invention, only going back as far as medieval Arabia. The purpose of hard liquor is either to get drunk fast or to create mixed drinks. And since you still need to start with a carbohydrate source, they also tend to be regional. Vodka is East European, whiskey and gin are from the British Isles, tequila is Mexican, and brandy is from Central and Southern Europe. Cultures around the world have also developed hot drinks, partly for the same reason we add spices to food, and partly because you can purify water by boiling it, but boiled water doesn't taste very good. Much like alcoholic drinks, ancient cultures would use whatever grew in their area, but unlike alcohol, hot drinks have much more international appeal. You can find tea and coffee just about anywhere you go these days, but grape wine is rare in Japan, and rice wine is rare in Mexico. Another drink worth mentioning is milk. Lactose, the sugar in milk, is normally supposed to be indigestible in adult mammals but several cultures that domesticated cattle and goats would drink their milk regularly and eventually developed a lactose tolerance. In regions where this didn't happen, lactose intolerance is much more common. As such, the presence or absence of milk and milk products in a culture's meals can say a lot about how their ancestors lived. 
Rot and Fermentation The difference between rotten food and fermented food is that fermented food is still edible. Aside from that, they've both undergone the same process. And while this process can add some valuable nutrition and help preserve food, it also tends to produce the most culturally unique foods. Certainly there are some fermented foods like pickles, soy sauce, and yogurt that go international, but then you have regional foods like sauerkraut, kimchi, and miso. Foods that can be very tasty to some people, but are absolutely repellent to others. If you want your setting to have a food that locals love, but foreigners definitely don't, consider using something fermented. Diet Restrictions In large parts of India, meat products are forbidden, and people survive entirely on vegetarian diets. Jews and Muslims are not allowed to eat pork, and both religions have additional restrictions referred to as kosher and halal, respectively. In most modernized nations, eating insects is not forbidden, but is considered disgusting or taboo. None of these restrictions have anything to do with nutrition or food availability, but they do have reasons for existing. Reasons related to historical pressures and culture conflicts. There are also several modern restricted diets, including several that are actively based around nutrition and health. These modern diets are based on individual decisions and fads rather than cultural or religious demands, but ultimately they are still influenced by cultural norms and mores, rather than food availability. As such, you can use a dietary restriction to make a culture in your setting stand out, whether that setting takes place in the past or in the future. Species Limitations if your fantasy setting includes a race of humanoid birds, it would make sense for them to eat chili peppers without experiencing any sort of burning sensation. If your setting includes cat people, then maybe like real cats, they're obligate carnivores and cannot digest any kind of plant-based food like vegetables, fruits, or grains. If your setting includes aliens from another planet, then maybe a chemical we consider an essential vitamin on Earth causes them to hallucinate. Maybe their bodies use ethanol as one of their essential vitamins. We know from life on Earth that different organisms can react in vastly different ways to the same chemicals, and these differences go well beyond things like cultural choices or personal preferences. To humans, cocoa powder has a rich smell and taste, but to dogs and cats, it is a poison that can kill them within hours. I mean, the same chemical in chocolate can kill humans, but you'd need a lot more chocolate to do it. The important point is this. If you want a non-human species in your setting to stand out, have them react differently to an ordinary human diet, or have one of their staple foods cause an interesting reaction in humans. Including food in a story. Developing food styles and diets for your setting is all well and good, but if you want that effort to pay off, you need to find ways to add food to your stories. Now, for some of you, that might be the most natural thing in the world, but a lot of authors push food into the background. Neither the characters never spend any time eating, or they just eat generic food when events need to take place during mealtimes. However, like I said at the start of this video, you can tell your audience a lot about the culture, geography, and biology of your setting by describing how people eat. You don't need to stop the story's progress in its tracks, either. Just spend one paragraph describing the food, maybe one more describing how people eat it, and then you're good. Now, with that being said, there are also ways to expand the importance of food, depending on the kind of story you want to tell. For instance, if your protagonist is a stranger in a strange land, then differences in food staples and eating habits are absolutely going to become part of that strangeness. If your protagonist has to survive a harsh environment, then figuring out how to get food that's safe and nutritious needs to be a part of that struggle. You can also use food and eating habits to underline the differences between two cultures, or between the protagonist and your target reader. Food is essential and universal. But differences in food can be very cultural and personal. That makes it a great vehicle for showing off the differences of your setting, no matter what kind of stories you're telling. So never let your food go to waste. Thanks for joining me again for today's journey into weaving worlds. Please like, share, and subscribe because that raises my visibility here on YouTube. Check out my other stuff if you have some time. Support me on Patreon if you have some money. And I hope I'll see you again for the next video.